Daniel Dennett is here, trailing storm clouds of controversy. He's a philosopher, a disturber of the peace, a provocateur who says the confrontation between religious faith and the modern scientific world is not going away. Long ago, Daniel Dennett introduced the first Frisbee into Britain when he was studying at Oxford. Ever since, he's been releasing arguments like thunderbolts aimed at notions of the supernatural and the ranks of the pious. He says the world is polarizing between the rational and the faithful, and it's time to break the spell of religion. That's the title of his latest book, Breaking the Spell, and it's being hotly debated from pulpits and talk shows to faculty lounges and op-ed pages. It's just the latest of many books, including Content and Consciousness, Freedom Evolves, and Darwin's Dangerous Idea. He teaches at Tufts University, where he heads the Center for Cognitive Studies. He's a self-described bright, the new word for atheist, and wrestling with God is not the only thing he does. He makes cider, picks blueberries, is a sculptor, and a sailor. Charlie had reached out to him a few weeks ago, and I'm here to welcome you, Daniel Dennett, to the show in Charlie Stead. Well, Bill, I'm delighted to be here. People who go around America confessing that they're, uh, or proclaiming that they are atheistic, are not going to win any popularity contests. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I find that everywhere I go, I find people, particularly young people, coming up to me and saying, thank goodness you're doing this. We're so grateful to you. you know, it's the first time we've heard a sane adult say anything like this. Uh, coming out of the closet as a bright is uh, actually, uh, I think, a very important political thing to do. I know a lot of people in, in many states would never dare do it. Where but, did that uh, term come from, bright? Uh, uh, um, uh, a couple of high school, ex-high school teachers in California came up with the idea, and they started a website, started a movement. It wasn't my coinage, although a lot of people think it was. I just decided this was worth a try, and so I decided to write about that and uh, did an op-ed piece in the New York Times. I remember that. Why, why not just use the old-fashioned <coughs> term for, for atheist or free thinker, which is a very popular well, name? Well, it? I think the idea was we needed a new happy term, something a little bit in your face, something, something with a little bit of an edge so it would catch people's attention. Uh, it was modeled very deliberately and very consciously on the homosexual uh, kidnapping of the word gay, which took some time, it was not all that popular at first, but eventually it caught on and I think everybody would have to say it was an important political move. When you say these young people come up to you and say, thank you, thank you, what are they thanking you for? They're thanking me for confirming their hunch that it is quite all right to be an atheist, quite all right to, you can be a moral person, you can be a deeply engaged person, and you, you don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. In the same way you could stand up and say, I'm a Baptist or I'm, I, I'm a Buddhist, you can say, I'm a Bright. There's a church in uh, Austin, Texas, <laughs> where I went to the University of Texas, a, a Presbyterian <laughs> church that kicked up a dust storm of controversy itself recently when it admitted uh, an atheist into membership. Uh, the pastor says they've gotten letters from both sides. The uh, Christians write to demand, quote, how can you let someone join the church who cannot affirm the divinity of Christ? What's wrong with you liberals? The atheists get letters asking, how can you as an atheist surrender your mind to a superstitious institution that gives birth to the Inquisition and the Crusades? That pretty well sums up the polarity, doesn't it? I think it does, but I don't think we have to be so polarized. I mean, I don't go around uh, advertising my atheism all the time. Anybody asks me, I tell them. Uh, I, I don't think it's that important, quite frankly. I'm not a militant atheist. In fact, uh, uh, I have a lot of uh, church-going friends. I even go to church myself on occasion. You go to church? Where? Um, in New England, I, I was raised a Congregationalist, and I... Uh, you were raised uh, a Christian? Oh, yes. Oh yes, Did and you I, think the, 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 I went to Sunday school, and I learned learned the hymns, and I and I uh, uh, still can recite some psalms. I'm pretty sure. Uh, sure. Did you uh, Did you think that the life of Jesus was the greatest story ever told, as many of us believed at the time? I thought it was pretty. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful story. Yes. What happened? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't believe the uh, uh, supernatural part of it. I even then, even as a child. I can't remember. Uh, I guess I did for a while. Uh, uh, but I th as soon as I thought about it seriously, I rejected that, sure. When did you become an atheist? What caused the, the, the shift there was the no mood? There was no dramatic shift. I was, I suppose, a teenager um, thinking about uh, what made sense and what was plausible. And uh, uh, I saw through other supernatural things just fine. I didn't see any reason to believe in poltergeists or... Uh, 
uh, uh, any of the other crazy supernatural stuff in astrology or trance channeling or anything like that. And I thought, well, I, I don't see any reason to believe these stories just because they're several thousand years old. Did you raise your children to be religious? No, but we did take them to, we did take them to church so that they could hear the music and learn the songs. And we, we, we do, we love Christmas. And we have a, a Christmas carol party that we've had for 25 years. And all our friends come and we all sing the music. What about your grandchildren? Do you want them to be raised in a, in, in, in a, tra in a traditional? Um, yes, I'd like them to know the tradition. I have a grandson, and um, uh, we've talked about this. He's not, in fact, going to Sunday school now, but uh, that would be fine if he did. We uh, went uh, on Saturday night to Carnegie Hall for Brahms Requiem. Now, here was a man, a great composer, yeah. who had no place in his life, really, for organized religion. And yet that music... Uh, opens with the words, blessed are they that mourn, for they will be comforted. Yes. And then the fourth movement of the Requiem draws on the 84th Psalm. How lovely are thy tabernacle, yep. O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee. Where do you think such longing arises? Well, I think the longing for comfort is not hard to understand. Uh, death is a terrible blow, and our species is unique in all the species on the planet in being able to imagine our deaths and knowing that we're going to die and not liking that idea. And I think we have two competing urges. This is not so much my theory as, as the theory of several other people uh, that I discuss in my book. One of them is, uh, uh, and these are, these are rooted actually in our, in our biology, they're, they're even rooted in our genes, and one of them is uh, to, to get away from a corpse. It's dangerous. It's, 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 it's a source of disease. It is something to, to, to withdraw from. At the same time, this is a loved one, and that's something to approach. So we're, we're tugged in two completely different directions, and you can't just leave the body of a loved one. You have to do something. But this and out of that grows the rituals, the burial rituals, and out of that grows the sense that that person is still there. After all, your head is still teeming with, well, I wonder if she'd like, and what would she think of, and can she see me now? All of these habits of mind that we have about anybody that's close to us, whether, whether we love them or hate them, actually, those habits don't just stop when a person dies. And so it's very natural to understand how those habits could be turned into a sort of hallucinatory presence. Joseph Campbell once said to me that he thought religion may well have begun when the first woman realized that was a corpse beside her and wondered where her husband had gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that longing expressed in the woman that it longingly expressed in the 84th Psalm moves on from just the desire for comfort to try to touch something transcendental. At least that's how I read this powerfully poetical language. Well, uh, Brahms Requiem is one of the great masterpieces of all time. I've sung it and loved it for years. What is uh, it touching you? Uh, it touches many chords in me. I can be uh, reduced to a shivering, trembling hulk by, by Bach, by the St. Matthew Passion, by by Brahms, I've sung in a lot of choirs and choruses in my day, and uh, the music moves me tremendously. Biologically? Brings... Is that a biological? Of course it is. What do you mean by it? You say religion earlier. You said religion has biological roots. What do you mean by that? And you say this, this response to this great music is biological. Well, it's partly biological. There's a biological basis. All the great composers knew how to, to, to pluck the heartstrings, how to create effects that were deeply moving. Bach was a genius. He, he, he did some very clever things. His, his great chorale cantatas, for instance, he took hymn tunes, the chorale tunes, that were already deeply familiar to the people that were coming to church. They were, they were like, like Home on the Range or Christmas Carols to us. And then he reworked those into these very moving cantatas. He, he knew what he was doing. He was a master at what I would call mimetic engineering. He was great at redesigning musical artifacts 
to to strum every chord in every person's heart. But I would not dare put myself in 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 in, in Brahms's mind. But don't you think don't you think he was reaching for a spiritual what he called a spiritual response, not a biological response? I want to make sure I understand of, of, that difference. Of, of course he was spiritual in the sense of having to do with your mind and what you know, your culture, the ideas, the stories that matter to you and why. We, we all of us, we start with our language, our mother tongue. This shapes our mind, our minds in unimaginably many ways. We imbibe stories, folklore, the Bible, the Koran, whatever the texts are, but also everything else, television, George Washington and the cherry tree, all of this lore furnishes our minds, and it's all available to be spoken to, to be rung in by poets, composers, preachers. Preachers are, I think that a really good preacher is, is like a jazz musician, is playing the old standards, but always changing them, always adding, and surprising the congregation with a few new riffs, and leaving out the parts that didn't go over so well when he did that same bit a few years ago. And so all of these traditions evolve over time, sometimes very deliberately when a church will decide to simply abandon some part of the liturgy or even stop putting those verses of the Bible in any of their, in any of their readings. You know perfectly well that most of the verses of the Bible are never going to be read out in church uh, be, because they don't speak to people today. But in church, the preacher's sermon, the music, all <clears throat> leads to the invocation of, of, of God. And I listen to you, and I, as I listen to you, I wonder, are you saying that God is, a, is essentially a linguistic contrivance to respond to the biological? No, you know. no, no. no. I'm, I, I'm saying that the word God is, of course, a linguistic contrivance. It's a word. And that word has been honored so much, has been treated so special that, of course, some religions say, you're not supposed to, you're sp not supposed to name God. But that's I really, am who I am. That, that's, and in fact, the same tradition, just with a mirror in front of it. It's, it's still, it's a, a, a sort of uh, uh, creating a fetish around the word. And, and as you know, today, hardly any two people agree on what they mean by God. And this creates, in fact, I think, a, a sort of preposterous illusion where people say, well, you know, we're not atheists because we all believe in God. But if you went around and asked the people around the table, well, what do you mean by God? What do you mean by God? What do you mean by God? You'd find it was all different. This is, this is a bad pun. This isn't, this isn't something that they all believe in. What do they believe in? They believe in belief. Belief? They believe that belief in God is so important that you should never even think about abandoning it, even if you have to change what you mean by God so much that it's just unrecognizable to somebody else. But then at least everybody can go around and say, well, I still believe in God. Well, I believe in democracy. Me too. Do you believe in God? No. Well, which God? I don't believe in the Old Testament God. I certainly don't believe in Yahweh. I don't believe in the God that created all creatures great and small. We have no need for, for a creator God uh, uh, to explain the evolution of the biosphere. Uh, uh, do I believe in Tillich's ground of all being? Yeah, I was going to ask you that. What, what is well, the ground? What is the ground? I don't know if I believe in it. If I knew the what it was. Well, but maybe, the unanswerable but question. God is the unanswerable question. But maybe you see, for some people, God is whatever it is that created all this wonderful life. Well, in that case, I believe in God because I believe in evolution. Do we and that is what created do, all of this. Do we have a ground of our being? Sure. We, we inhabit a spectacularly wonderful physical universe. It has evolved over billions of years, and life has evolved on this planet for billions of years, and here we are. And it is so wonderful to be alive, to, to have the privilege of being part of this amazing scene, 
And it would be nice to be able to say thank you to somebody. I feel gratitude, but there's nobody to thank, so the best I can do is resolve to make the planet a little better for the next person. In one of your earlier books, you in fact said the world is sacred. Yeah. What did you mean by that? All? Just what I, just what I just said. I mean, this is something worth devoting yourself to. This is something worth devoting your life to. Protecting this, preserving it, honoring it, understanding it, studying it, with a sense of awe. We don't, I mean, Anselm notoriously, famously, defined God Early as, philosopher the, in the, as Christian the, Church, the right. being greater than which nothing can be conceived. It's a very hard phrase to get your head around. The most perfect, imaginable being. Well, now, is the universe itself the being greater than which nothing can be conceived? Well, it's greater than I can conceive. It's greater than any one person, scientist or cosmologist or philosopher can conceive. If, if that's what God is, then I believe in it, and I believe that it outstrips my understanding. But you said a moment ago uh, that, that you wanted to express gratitude. You want to say thanks in yeah. response for this marvelous uh, universe. Yeah. But a lot of people need to thank some being, some one. Well, right? Why? I said, well, don't they? Well, do they? Why? I think they do, but why? Well, that's what I ask you. You're the you well, wrote the book breaking well, the spell. <laughs> well, I think I think actually the answer to that is is quite clear. Um, an instinct that we share with mammals in general is when something that we don't understand happens, when something startling or surprising or worrisome happens, the most natural thing in the world, it's really instinctual, is to go, "Who's there? Who's there? And what do you want? Not what's that, but who's there? Why?" Because sometimes there's somebody there, and that somebody might want you. So when you're startled, looking for an agent, looking for a being that has beliefs and desires, looking for a being that's conscious, is a very good strategy, even if you have a lot of false alarms. So your dog does it. The, the snow falls off the roof and lands with a thud outside, outside the window, and your dog jumps up and growls and looks around. That's... That's the very same instinct in the dog that we have. The thing, the difference is that in us, it doesn't stop with just looking around to, and then going back to sleep. It echoes and echoes and echoes. And so we begin to populate our world with imaginary, invisible agents. Their who is there. And that initial population explosion of that's not religion, that's just superstition. That's goblins and leprechauns and elves and things like that. But they are the ancestors in idea space of the few gods and then eventually the monotheistic god that, that gets the name so God say, with a capital G. So you're saying religion evolved? Yeah, absolutely. Is that what you mean when you say the subtitle of Breaking the Spell is religion as a natural phenomenon? Of course. Of course religion evolved. The religion of today is very different from the religion of 2,000 years ago. It's as different or more than the music of today is different from the music of 2,000 years ago. Music is a natural phenomenon. It didn't always exist. It's existed for thousands of years. It's evolved all along. That's cultural evolution. Language is a natural phenomenon. It didn't always exist. It came into existence. It's evolved. It's still evolving. Music, language, religion, it's another natural phenomenon. Didn't always exist. It's, as, as phenomena go, it's a quite a young phenomenon. It's younger than, ag it's, well, organized religion is younger than agriculture, which is only about 10,000 years old. Language is older than religion. Music is probably older than religion. So then why do, are you saying that people believe because they've been programmed to believe? Program. Um, do you do you believe that cheese is tasty because you've been programmed to believe you've tasted it and you like it? And I mean, uh, we get our beliefs from the interaction between the world we discover and our innate dispositions. What our genes our genes do build biases into into us. For instance, we have a sweet tooth. We automatically like sweet things 
better than bitter things. And there's no mystery about why that is. There's a deep biological reason why we have a craving for sweet things. As we have a craving for God? Indeed. In fact, in fact, our sweet tooth is, by general admission, no longer such a good thing. It's sort of outlived its biological usefulness. Now that we live in a world where there's a surfeit of sugar, it's no longer, it no longer helps us. But we don't have, we can't get rid of it. It's, it's in our genes, but we don't have to indulge it. We don't have to succumb to it. Some people do, but we don't have to. You're We've learned how to, how to work around our sweet tooth. Now, do we have a sweet tooth for God? Yeah, we sure do. And you think there's a surfeit of, of that sweet tooth for God, right? That's, that's what I take, one of the things I take away from your book is that you think we have a surfeit of belief in God. Uh, no, actually, I do not know. Because here's what I don't know. And I say in the book, until we do more research, we just can't tell. We have sugar and we have saccharin. Saccharin is, the, is the, maybe the healthier substitute for sugar. And they both satisfy our craving. Now the question is, religion, is it sugar or saccharin? If it's saccharin and we cut it out of our diet, we may be in real trouble. Because then we may indulge our cravings, whatever they are, with things which are worse for us than religion. See, I think this is where your, your, your critics really come after you. They say, you, you, you think that God can be put to a scientific test like everything else. And if God is God, God is beyond the, the, the observation and verification process of science. Oh, God is very definitely beyond the verification process of science. God has been designed to be beyond the verification process of science. This is one of the, one of the, the classic adaptations of religions, is to, is to create this gulf so that, so that science can't get anywhere near God. That's true. But science can understand that very fact. You say that... Well, science, can under, science can understand how religions evolved and why... By the way, that idea is completely absent in folk religions, which are the ancestors. The idea of... The idea of God being, as it were, beyond science. They don't make a distinction between science and religion. The, if folk religions, it's all the same. It's all one. This is just what everybody knows. And they have no concept of faith. They don't need a concept of faith. It's only once you start getting this separation between science and other things that people think they know when maybe they don't, that's when the idea of faith looms and becomes a very attractive idea. And indeed it is. It protects the idea of God from disproof. Why is this of such concern to you, uh, Dan? Uh, if, if my faith doesn't pick your pocket or break your bone, as Thomas Jefferson said, yeah. why should you care what I believe? Well, exactly. I, uh, I wouldn't accept that religious people care so much about what everybody else believes. Why do they care? Why do Christians care what Muslims believe? Why do Muslims care what Christians believe? And to me, the really dangerous thing about religion, and this is not everybody, of course, it's, it, it's not half, thank goodness, but it's many. And that is, the one thing that I think is really dangerous in many religions is that it gives people a gold-plated excuse to stop thinking. To stop thinking. To stop thinking. To say, I don't have to think about that because my religion says this is right, this is wrong, it's as clear as that, it's black and white, I don't have to think about this anymore. It's just a matter of faith. Well, and, this, and we honor that. We say, oh, it's a matter of faith. I think we have to stop honoring people for stopping thinking. I think we have to say to people, fine, you have your faith, great. Your job then, your duty to your own faith, is to explain to those of us who do not share your faith why you're right about this. Let it be true that God told you. Let it be absolutely true. God told you this is the right way and these ways are wrong. Right. Your problem now is to explain to those of us that God didn't speak to why, why, why this is right. But as that story I told of what happened in the Presbyterian Church in Austin when the Christians uh, denounced the uh, minister mm -hmm. for allowing a atheist in the congregation, yep. and the atheist denounced the uh, atheist for surrendering to the superstition of the church. 
you can't have a real dialogue between people who say, I'm speaking for God, and people who say there is no God to speak. Well, can you? I don't see why not. It seems to me that those people who have their faith, who believe so strongly in God, if they really believe strongly in their God, they believe they're right, they believe that they, they, are, they occupy the moral high ground, they should be only too willing to sit down and put this, not to the scientific test, but to the political moral discussion test of talking about why they believe what they believe, and let's talk about, the main thing we want to talk about is what should we do? What, what's the moral course of action to take? And if that is to be a reasonable discussion, we have to take a few cards off the table. Such as? The faith card. Well, we have to take the faith card off the table. What do you mean take the faith card off the table? I mean, if, 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 if one is a man of faith, <laughs> one can't take, the, can't take the gene out. Well, you know, Lucille says you're wrong. You, you know who Lucille is? Mm -mm. She's a friend of mine. She's always right. I can't play that card in an argument. If I, it's just rude of me to say, you know, Lucille says you're wrong. You say, well, who's Lucille? I say, well, a friend of mine, always right. But we're End of the discussion. But, but we're confronted today by people who say they know the mind of God. And, and I, think the, scripture and to I reveal think it. And I think the way we should deal with them is to say, well, that's very interesting because now you've got a real problem. Since the rest of us don't know the mind of God, we can't share your, uh, your direct line. So you're going to have to do the best you can in a secular discussion about what the right thing to do is. You Are you up to the task of explaining to the rest of us who don't have your hotline to God why you're right? And don't just tell me that God told you. We know that. We All accept right. that. Suppose I'm sitting here, I'm a Muslim, and I yep. say to you, look, five, book 5, verse 44 yep. uh, condemns uh, uh, apostasy and, and yes. says the heretic should be uh, put to death. And yes. I'm telling you that this is my holy script, yep. uh, and, and I believe that is the case. What do you say to me? I say, well, the fact that it says it in, in, in your holy text is, a, is an interesting historical fact, but it doesn't settle whether it's right. It just doesn't. But it settles for me, speaking for the Muslim, that it's true. Uh, well, it is possible, of course, that many people are simply morally incapacitated for engaging in moral deliberation. How they come? You have to do it. Wouldn't you have to submit that to a scientific test of well, observation well, if, and if verification? They can't, if they can't, if they can't, if they can't hold a, a discussion a reasonable, respectful political discussion about these issues without uh, simply playing the faith card, then I guess they have to admit that they can't defend what they're saying. I think the big problem that we have is we have been too willing just to let people play the faith card, and it just trumps everything. And the tr it might have been all right, except it's being abused a great deal around the world today. And I think, and besides, nobody believes that. Let's face it. If somebody came up and said, look, my religion says that, that um, uh, well, I, I don't have to make up a case. I'm going to take the case of apostasy you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. There are clerics in Islam right now who say, death for apostasy, that's our religion, and we should do it. And I think everybody in the world should stand up and say, don't be ridiculous. Don't be silly. That is, that is barbaric. It is simply beyond the pale. It doesn't matter what your tradition is. This is not a tradition that, that should be honored. Now the church wants it. The church once put, the Catholic Church once put heretics to the Absolutely state. Absolutely right. And they've Submitted learned better, position. haven't they? They've learned, they have learned. And, and I, think we should, I think we should not be afraid to say to the Muslim world, come on, wake up. We made this mistake in the past, too, we Christians. But we're not making it anymore. We, Christians, we Jews, that certainly, certainly Christians and Jews certainly made that mistake in the past. When I read this book, I, there were so many themes running through it. You see, you'll see my margins are pink and red and yellow. With oh, good. All that's what I wanted to do. But the thing I wrote in one margin was, you know, <coughs> you were talking here, uh, in effect, about how democracy, in the, how we as a nation in the early days made an agreement to avoid absolutes. We said yep. we're going to put absolutes off the table when it comes to 
questions yeah. of religion. That's what some people call the separation of church and state. It was that we will not organize our politics around a battle yeah. for absolutes. Yeah. Do you see that endangered today? Yeah, I do indeed. Um, I, think, I think we're living at a time where uh, it's time for people really to stand up and, and be counted and, and make very clear where they stand to, on, the, to, on the separation of church and state. I saw a sign the other day, I'm for the separation, a bumper sticker, I'm for the separation of church and hate. Uh, interesting. Twist. Well, yes, that's, that's good, too. You know, um, uh, in the book, I tell the story, which, which you will remember, younger, younger readers won't, of, of Charlie Wilson, when, he was, when Eisenhower uh, wanted to appoint him to be his <laughs> Secretary of Defense. This was 50 years ago. And Wilson was the CEO of General Motors. And he said, or was reported to have said, that what's good for General Motors is good for the country. And he was jumped on by everybody. And they said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And actually what he said was, what's good for the country is good for General Motors and vice versa. But what they said is, look, even if you're right that what's good for General Motors is good for the country, we want to know, what would you do if Bush came to show? What if, what if in some instance, some policy you had to decide as Secretary of Defense, you could see that what was good for the country wasn't necessarily good for General Motors. Then where would your first priority be? They wanted to make sure that his priority was what's good for the country, not what's good for General Motors. And they required him to put his holdings in a blind trust and all the rest of that. Now, imagine the, a politician today saying, well, what I've always believed is what's good for the Baptist church is good for the country. I don't think we should stand for that. I think we should make the same human cry. We should say, hang on. We don't mind you having your priorities that way, but if that's what your priorities are, I think we want somebody else to be in office because we want the people that we have in office to put the preservation of the democracy, the preservation of the separation of church and states, the preservation of our secular democracy ahead of their religion. Look what we're doing in Iraq. We're, we're, we're asking the Iraqis to put being an Iraqi ahead of being a, uh, a Kurd or a, a Sunni or a Shiite. And that's a tall order to ask them to do that. That's what we're asking them to do. Well, why don't we ask ourselves to do the same thing? You know, there are a lot of people who would say amen to that, you know, <laughs> pun intended. They would say amen to yeah. that. They would believe with oh, you we that no matter, no, no matter what their uh, strong opinions they, about their own faith, they would agree with that. Absolutely but, right. But the issue is that the people who, the fundamentalists, who do believe, yep. the, the, take the Bible yep. literally, who do believe they know the mind of God, and who do want to see their yep. values articulated in the political process, and yep. in fact enshrined in our political institution. I don't see them wanting to have a conversation uh, with you about this. Well, I agree. A lot of them don't want to have the conversation. But I think that we ought to say, well, you know, so far, so far, this is a democracy, and that's how we settle these things, but with a conversation. Did you and if they're not prepared to do that, then I think we have to really seriously think about whether we, first of all, I'm quite, I, I insist, they have every right in this country to put the good of their religion ahead of the good of the country. Fortunately, there are enough people who don't see it that way so that we can tolerate those who do, but we don't have to elect them. What is the most important point of your book that you think has been caricatured or, or, or most deeply misunderstood by your critics? Well, I think, I think the standard claim is I'm trying to destroy religion, and I'm absolutely not trying to destroy religion. I'm trying to, to make sure that religion is not toxic. Everybody knows that there's toxic varieties of religion in every religion. Religion, every re religion heals, religion kills, right? Absolutely right. <laughs> now, how can, we, how can we steer away from the toxic varieties? And I have since we haven't done the research that I'm calling for, uh, I can't give a lot of policy recommendations. That would, be, that would be contradicting my claim that until we do the research, we don't know what we're doing. We've got to study religion more. But in the meantime, I have one proposal which I think is really important, and that is we should have a national curriculum on world religions that is compulsory for all school children, from grade school through high school, for the public schools, for the private schools, for the homeschooling. And my, Why? Because if we taught the young people of a country this, then you could teach them whatever else you wanted. And I wouldn't worry about religions that, 
I think any religion that could flourish under those conditions would be a benign, a valuable, a wonderful religion. I think it's only, if you look at the toxic religions, they are all the religions that survive by the enforced ignorance of their young. And all we have to do, I think, is we can tell people, you can homeschool your kids, you can, you can give them 30 hours a week of religious instruction, but you've also got to teach them what the people that are not of your faith believe, and you have to teach them about the history of all the faiths in question, including your own. That's asking a lot of uh, people who take religion so seriously that they do not <laughs> want their uh, children or their own minds no. to be competitive with other religions. Well, but how very un-American of them to think that. I mean, this is the land of democracy and of an informed choice. What are they afraid of? The other criticism that I take from your critics, the chief criticism I take from your critics, is that you want to reduce everything to the scientific process, that you believe everything ultimately can be understood by the process of observation and verification, trial and error, including religious belief. Not a, I don't think everything can be understood at all levels using science. No, I think, I think we need philosophy and poetry and history. And I mean, if you include those as sciences... And in one sense, they are. In German, they would be. They're Wissenschaft. Uh, so then history and, and uh, the study of literature and archaeology and, and uh, for that matter, poetics and literary criticism counts as a kind of science. I think everything about religion, everything about everything, can be at least partially understood through the methods of rational inquiry. And I am amused when people say they can't make up their mind whether they say, well, you can't or you shouldn't. And I think mainly they're afraid that you can, and that's why they say you shouldn't try. It's amazing how much we can understand about a lot of things. And I know that one of the reasons that some people are very uh, um, anxious about my book yeah. is that they... They see me as uh, showing how the magicians do their tricks. That's right. That's right. But you see, if we're talking about music, you can go in and you can show how Bach does his tricks and how Brahms does his tricks. You can show how poets do their tricks. You can show how doctors do their tricks. You can show how doctors, how important their bedside manner is. Yes, we can, we can do this. And we can, show, we can show how religions do their tricks, too. And, and every religion does it. Every religion does it. And why shouldn't we understand that just as well as we understand? It's, it's, every religion has its own technology for belief maintenance. And we can, we can look under the hood and see how it works. John Cage, the composer, mm -hmm. a year after 9-11, wrote a very moving uh, work uh, in memorial <clears throat> for the victims of 9-11. It was performed at Lincoln Center. He said he was trying to create a memory space uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in that music that he said was inspired by the old majestic cathedrals in France or Italy. Here's a direct quote from John Cage. When you walk into the Chart Cathedral, for example, you experience an immediate sense of something otherworldly. You feel you're in the presence of many souls, generations mm -hmm. upon generations of them, and you sense their collected energy as if they were all congregated or clustered in that one spot. And even though you might be with a group of people or the cathedral itself filled with other churchgoers or tourists, you feel very much alone with your thoughts and you find them focused in a most extraordinary and spiritual way. Now, you wouldn't explain that as a trick, would you? Trick is a, is a pejorative term. First of all, I, com I completely agree with John Cager. You've in had fact, that experience. In fact, indeed. In fact, uh, uh, you mentioned that I, I, I a, was at least a sculptor. And I have a, my one bronze piece that I have is called Three People in the Cathedral. And that's the very point of it, is to show how going in the cathedral just exalts you. And the, the three people have sort of taken on this, this you would say, transcendent uh, attitude from their presence in this amazing building. I am, I am uh, a lover of cathedrals, and I, I feel their power. I do think that that power can be understood. 
And I don't think it, it is can, it diminished. Can be understood. I don't think it is how, diminished. How, how, what do you mean it can be understood? It, it can be, I said to Joseph Campbell, you're a man of faith. He said, I don't need faith, I have experience. Uh, interesting, subtle transformation yes. of the question. How do you understand that experience in that cathedral? First of all, it helps to be steeped in the traditions of the cathedral, to be able to look up and to tell which saint that is up there in that niche and which story is being illustrated in this panel and to recognize the music and to know its roots. I think that knowing the lore, the traditions, the history of Christianity, it's the only religion I know well, uh, I couldn't understand it without, without steeping myself in that lore a lot. And one of the reasons that I don't write about Hinduism in this book is I just haven't had time to, to <laughs> marinate in all the world of the Hindus. Other people are going to have to do that. All right, but you know the Lord, but there are people, I've seen people climb those cathedrals steps who had no knowledge whatsoever of the lore, of the statues, yep. of the carvings, of yep. the yep. tradition, but they are deeply moved by what? And, and I'm deeply moved by Chichen Itza, which, is, which, which was a, a, uh, in Mexico, which, which was a, a, a temple which was used for human sacrifices. It's an awesome blood-curdling and hair-raising experience to stand there and to realize what the religious practices were that were engaged in there. It's very moving, and thank goodness you don't have to believe in it to be moved. But you're talking in the cathedrals about the aesthetics of it, right? Here you're talking about the history of it in these, in these pyramids. Well, I'm it, talking about the aesthetics in both places. I mean, Chichen Itza is a fabulous yes. and beautiful place. And, so is it and, beauty moving you? Of course. Religions have always harnessed beauty, every religion, because this is a way of harnessing love. And what better idea could there be than to bring love to your side and make it, make it a partner in whatever you're doing? I think one of the reasons that secular organizations can't compete with churches for creating allegiances, lifelong sacrificing allegiances, is that they are shy about enlisting love and beauty on their sides, whereas religions aren't shy about that at all. Now, they do a brilliant job. I was very struck in the book that you acknowledge that in large parts of America today, religion yep. does the heavy lifting Absolutely. because those institutions actually attract people's affections and commitments more than the secular institutions. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why I don't want to destroy religion because I think religions in, in those guises are doing a tremendous job of creating infrastructure for moral teamwork. And moral I think teamwork? For moral teamwork. What do you mean? Look at the job the churches did in, 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 in ending segregation. Look at the job the churches did in ending apartheid. There is no uh, human institution on the planet that can match a church for creating a cadre of people who are powerfully motivated and devoted, they're willing to take risks, they're willing to make huge sacrifices, they're willing to devote their lives to a cause. And that's all wonderful. There's one thing about it that I really worry about. What's that? And that is, unlike their secular counterparts, they are too willing to say about complicated matters, don't worry. We've got the answer, and it's very simple. And they encourage people to stop thinking. And, and that's, if, you know, a secular organization, if it was prepared to say, oh, look, these issues are all very cut and dried. We've got a book which says exactly what you should do on every occasion. Just, just listen to the authorities in our church. They're the ones, they're the only, you don't have to think it through. They will tell you the right and wrong here. Secular organizations won't do that. But I know so many people uh, of towering intellect who are, who are uh, Christians, mm -hmm. who, who, are, who are people of, of faith. They yep. don't see that and, but reason don't, violates their, but, their but, faith. But those are people who are also, very often, the first to stand up and say, in one informal or formal organization or another, to their own church, 
but we don't approve of the, of the path you're now taking us down. We've thought about this, and we do not approve the path that you're taking us down. If you look around, you, you certainly you know thinking Christians who have trouble with one doctrine or another that their particular church maintains. Thinking Catholics, for instance, who have trouble with the church on birth control uh, or on abortion. And I honor the fact that they stand up to the church and they try to change the leadership of their church. I think that's the way to be a good Christian. It's the way to be a good Muslim. Look what we have in the Muslim world right now. Two of the people I admire most in the world right now are Wafa Sultan and Irshad Manji, two brave Muslim women who are speaking out against the excesses of Islam, and they are risking their lives to do it. But you say in this country you think moderates have entered into a conspiracy of silence. I know. I'm asking them to, to get as brave as those two Muslim women and get out there and, and start changing things. How do we... How do we in this democratic society build humane and efficient institutions that can attract the affection and the loyalty and the commitment of all of us, no matter what our powerful thing? Boy, that, that is a great question, Bill, and, and it's one that I am trying to answer. And I think the answer may well be, let's use the churches, indeed let's use the churches, but let's understand that we're going to use all the churches and we're not going to tolerate the enforced ignorance of the young in those churches. They Are you can, in support? They can teach what they want, but they've also got to... If, think, of, think of the transformation that would be in the Islamic world if young Muslims were taught about the history of Christianity, the history of Buddhism, the history of Hinduism, the history of Confucianism, the history of Islam. The history of God. The history of all of those, and the history of, of atheism, too. Think of what that would do to Islam. Think of what it would, think of the transformation of Islam, and including the girls in the education. Well, how, can, how can we not press this forward? So the theists have not proven that God exists, and the atheists have not proven that God That's does right. not exist. Right. Where does this leave us? It, it leaves us at a complete standoff, and let's leave it there. That is not the important issue. I mean, one of, I think one of the points of my book is that for, for deeply religious people that I've talked to, the arguments of philosophers for and against the existence of God just don't cut any ice. That's, that's fun for philosophers. But that's not, that's not what, they, what matters to them. Nobody is convinced to, uh, uh, of the existence of God by those. I've never met a person yet no. who started off atheistic and then, and then read um, uh, uh, Aquinas and Anselm and, and uh, 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 Paley and said, oh, my gosh, I guess God exists. I've never met such a person. And I, I've met very few who were really convinced by the, by the atheist arguments in the other direction either. I think, first of all, as I said, since the term God has been pretty much decoupled from any comprehensible, clear meaning that everybody can share, it means that who knows what atheism even is? I mean, how many different kinds of atheists do I have to be to be an atheist? Um, uh, you are an atheist about every one of those except one. I just go the full the full root. I don't see a single one that I think really deserves to be called God. So what Although, does... if, if somebody wants to say that, that what, what they mean when they say they're a theist is that they believe that the universe is just a wonderful, wonderful place, and I say, whoa, whoa, then I believe in that too. Does that make me a theist? But many people still, millions of people still want house calls. They want to be able to know, believe that God has visited them. And what do we do about this? Because we, we all recognize that there's some borderline over which we don't, we, we don't know where to draw the line. Some people are just being deluded. They're being fleeced. They're being taken to the cleaners. They may be, they're giving their money to some charlatan, some faith healer charlatan. And if we know that, do we not have a moral obligation to speak out and say, 
hang on, do you realize that you're, you're being conned here? Now, if you do that, you may destroy somebody's precious illusion, and we shouldn't do that lightly. And I'm not calling on us to do that. I am saying it's a problem. And it's a problem because it creates a hypocrisy trap that we're all in. Hypocrisy trap. It was nicely exposed recently when Mel Gibson, a fundamentalist Catholic, blurted out in an interview in The New Yorker that his wife was damned. She was going to hell because she wasn't a, she wasn't a Roman Catholic. And that's, as he put it, that's what the chair says, and I go with what the chair says. And, and a lot of people were shocked by this. A lot of Catholics were deeply dismayed by this. Two groups of Catholics. Those that don't believe that at all, and just thought, this is, this is an embarrassment to our, our religion. And those who do believe it, but think it was very impolitic of him to say it. How many are in which group? Who knows? That's the hypocrisy trap. Right now, we have a Congress. Every single member of Congress believes in God. How many do you suppose really believe in God? Who knows? And sometimes they have the best of reasons for not saying what they really believe in. They'll get beat. <laughs> they'll, they'll get beat. That's a, but there's even other reasons, too. I mean, there's, Granny would, it would break her heart to know that I've lost my faith. So you, but, so you button your lip. And so we're living in a world where there's just layer after layer after layer of hypocrisy. And I think we should start trying to cut through that. The book is Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon. Daniel C. Dennett. Thank you very much for being with us, and Charlie would send his best. Thank you, Bill. I've enjoyed talking with you very much.